Hey yo gang, so check me out right, I have no idea what this video is about, the waste management scandal, but we're gonna hit subscribe and we're gonna hit like, we're gonna show support and I would love for you to do the same for me. Alright, let's get into it. This is a topic we don't normally want to talk about. Put the garbage can on the curb, watch the truck take it away, and it's out of our lives. Do you know Waste Management? Maybe you've seen their name on the side of some trash cans or dumpsters. They have that green and yellow logo. Well, they're the main company in the United States that deals with our trash. They take it from businesses, residential areas, have contracts with the cities, bring it to transfer stations, and compact it, but it ultimately ends up in landfills, of which they own and operate more than anyone else in the United States. The industry has been consolidated but they seem to be the ones coming out on top of it. They reported almost $18 billion in revenue in 2021, and I think we can believe that number, but in the past, well... This is a statement That's released a by the SEC in 2002. The Securities and Exchange Commission filed suit today against the founder and five other former top officers of Waste Management Incorporated, charging them with perpetrating a massive financial fraud lasting more than five years. The complaint, filed with the U.S. District court in Chicago charges the defendants engaged in a systematic scheme to falsify and misrepresent waste management's financial results between 1992 and 1997. This is also from it. Our complaint describes one of the most egregious accounting frauds we have seen. For years, these defendants cooked the books, enriched themselves, preserved their jobs, and duped unsuspecting shareholders. Let's go back to the 1950s. This was a different time, even when it came to waste collection. I guess you can say it was a much smaller and simpler industry back then. There wasn't nearly as much waste being produced compared to today, and to reflect that, the regulations concerning where and how to dispose of it were much more relaxed. Since Makes it sense. wasn't a big deal, garbage was usually taken care of by the town or the city, or in some cases, there were small private companies that would do it. But in the 1950s is when the industry started expanding, because all of a sudden, there was way more garbage being produced. This no, honestly, this is not what I thought the video was going to be, but this is mad interesting because I'm not going to hold you. I actually do want to own eventually a garbage company, like a waste management company. I've, I've thought about that for like the past four or five years and like I would merge some sort of garbage company and a recycling company or maybe buy one that does the two. Because if you think about it, bro, recycling, especially in America, isn't really done right. You feel me? And there's a lot of different recyclings that could be done that isn't done. Like I was thinking about too, like recycling dirt and stuff like that, or recycling plastic in a different way, like making building blocks out of plastic. And then like maybe a year ago, a year and a half ago, I found out continuing my research because like almost every summer I kind of update on some of my ideas and um there's this lady who's actually leading that right now and that's amazing I can't remember her name but she's leading this project where people are recycling plastic like not the normal plastic that you re could easily recycle but the harder plastics into building blocks and that's cool as hell elon musk used his boring tunnel thing his his worm machine thing to recycle the dirt and he built a compacting machine to make bricks on site with the recycled dirt stuff like that you feel me i always think about stuff like that so when i saw this i thought you know waste management scandal when i first came to the united states I was working at Dorney Park and one night I was, we were throwing away food and I was like, yo, why don't we uh, pack up some of this food and give it to homeless people around the area? I see a whole lot of homeless people, like that's, that's cool. We could start something like that. And this one kid was like, oh yeah, that would be cool, but they'll never allow it. I um, started doing more research, asking more people, trying to find out why would they not allow this? And the guy was like, oh, we have to throw away the food at the end of the night. Um, and then we uh, we have to report it. Blah, blah, blah. But that's like the highest they went, right? 
Then I ended up working at Home Depot for one summer and I was talking to this like 70 year old dude who was telling me how the American government like how taxes work and how write-off works now this was my second summer here it was the very next summer so I really didn't know a lot of that stuff and I immediately put two and two together and was able to figure out like oh that's what he meant by they have to write it off they have to report it when the dude said they have to report the food so when you put two and two together bro all these places throw away food and like restaurants and like companies your 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 parks Disney, well i don't want to say it. anyways your parks and all of those places why they throw away food so that at the end of the year they could write it off as waste or non-good broken products you feel me if they still give it out to homeless people and do actual charitable work with it then the food did serve its intended purpose and cannot be written off as spoiled goods isn't that messed up bro like what what a world bro where where corporate rules are more realized than just simple courtesy for another human being you feel me bro like crazy bro they don't give away free food because they can't write it off bro that's crazy to me so i thought this video was going to be something about that but i kind of like how uh where it's going so i started looking up over here some waste management information and it looks like the scandal is real gang so so far verified was right after World War II. There was a baby boom happening, so the population was expanding at an incredible rate, and the economy was strong, so everyone was buying things. Mm -hmm. And the things people were buying were now packaged in these disposable containers. Combine all these factors, and you have yourself a lot of garbage. Mm -hmm. In 1956, there was a small garbage collection company called A Scavenger. The original founder had just died, and it was taken over by his son-in-law, Dean Buntrock. <laughs> at the time, they were only operating 12 garbage trucks around the Chicago area, but Buntrock took notice of the new potential in the industry. To take advantage of it, he invested heavily in expanding this business. All the ways you would expect, buying new trucks and making deals for garbage collection in new areas, even acquiring some of their smaller competitors. Mm -hmm. In 1965, the government responded to this nationwide increase of trash production and the impact of it by passing the Solid Waste Disposal Act of 1965. Without getting into the specifics, Specifics of it, it basically provided some stricter rules when it came to collecting and disposing of garbage. There okay, were now a higher standards. Hold on, somebody did tell me I need to do more research, and I ain't gonna lie to you, I have no idea what this is. Increase of trash production and the impact of it by passing the Solid Waste Disposal Act of 1965. Without okay, getting into the specifics waste. of it, it basically provided some stricter rules Disposal when it came Act. to collecting and disposing of garbage. There were now a higher all right, gang, so the Solid Waste Disposal Act, SWDA, was passed by the United States Congress, 1965, like he just said. Da, 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 da. Amended in 1976. Uh, general provision, powers and duties of commission, permits authorizing governing construction, da, da, da. Okay. Okay. So I guess this right here is what I was looking for. So the, the act basically governs these things. I guess it would be like procedures and how to get rid of certain wastes, uh, what your facilities may need to have, uh, storm drain, like, you know, runoff, spills, this, that, and the third, you know, probably zoning as well. You can't be too close to residential zones, I'd assume. It'll cover the fees for like general fees, maybe, and maybe fees if you commit any transgressions against the act or disobey any of the rules that will probably come under enforcement or things that like the government will do to enforce that you do follow these things and clean up for potential spills, maybe. I don't know, but okay. Okay, so that's what the act is, gang. I just wanted to like do a little quick research to make sure that we're not just watching any random video on YouTube and just taking it face value.
higher standards that had to be met, which meant there were higher costs for everyone in the industry. And if you couldn't afford them, well, that was it. It was sink or swim time, and only the larger, more professional, put together companies survived. Luckily, Ace Scavenger spent the last decade expanding, so they made it. A couple years later, they merged with another similar company, and the resulting company was called Waste Management. This was obviously a situation where only the strongest survived. Waste Management knew it, and they did everything they could to grow stronger. In 1971, they had an initial public offering that brought in money that they immediately used to start acquiring competing companies. They bought 90 smaller trash hauling companies in 1972. 19. From there, they landed some contracts from other countries to start taking care of their garbage. They started getting involved in the disposal of chemical and toxic waste on which the government was making new regulations. In their first year of operation as waste management in 1968, their revenue was 5.5 million. Compare that to the early 80s when it was now hovering around 1 billion. What? In the 1980s, they were involved in a line of scandals that involved dumping hazardous waste in illegal places. Now, the accusations run much deeper, but they admitted to doing this in a site in Ohio and another one in Alabama, which resulted in millions of dollars in fines, a sharp decline in their stock price, and a lot of negative publicity. Hmm. But that's not even the scandal I, I want to talk about. They actually made a pretty quick recovery from it's it. Another I just one. mention it right here so we can get an idea of who we're dealing with here. In the early 90s, after years of mostly non-stop growth and success, Success, they finally started experiencing some major financial troubles. There's a few internal and industry-wide reasons we could blame for it, but I think the simplest and quickest way to explain it is it was a weaker economy. People weren't buying as much stuff, so they were producing less garbage, hmm. and businesses weren't making as much stuff, and that also means less garbage. Okay. In 1993, the revenue fell for the first time ever, and profits were down. <laughs> do you know when you're a kid and you get a bad grade, so you're afraid to tell your parents about it? I mean, what can you do? You didn't do well, so you have to go home and face the music. Or if you're a little unethical, you could skillfully pull out your red marker and change that grade. This is essentially what waste management did every year from 1992 to 1997. I don't know if you're familiar with the stock market, but if your earnings come in below expectations, it is not good for your stock price, and it's not good for the company in general. They definitely had pretty big motivation to lie about their earnings, but it's not as simple as changing that final number with a red marker. Here's some of the things they did to make it appear that they were doing better than they actually were. As the SEC put it, they avoided depreciation expense on their garbage trucks by assigning unsupported and inflated salvage values and extending their useful lives. This is a big one, so let me explain. When you buy an asset, such as a garbage truck, you capitalize it, meaning it's not an expense right away, it's expensed gradually as it depreciates. Okay. To figure out how much you depreciate it each year, you take the purchase price, which is what you paid for it, subtract the estimated salvage value, which is what you think you can get for it once you're done with it, and then if you're using the straight line method, you divide that number by the number of years you expect it to be useful. Okay. I know that was a lot, but just a made-up example. Say they bought a garbage truck for $50,000, and they expect to use it for five years and estimate they can sell it for $10,000 once they're done with it. Okay. So the accountant over at Waste Management takes the cost, $50,000, subtracts the $10,000 salvage value, and divides that over the five years, resulting in an $8,000 depreciation expense each year. That's okay. how it should be. But then we have this crooked management team over here saying, forget the $10,000 salvage value, just say we can get $20,000. I know we can't, but just say that we can. Reworking the calculation oh. with the new number gives them a $6,000 depreciation expense each year, which is $2,000 lower than it was before, and a effectively adds money to their earnings that shouldn't be there. Hmm. Same thing with extending that useful life. Change that five years to 10 years, that $6,000 expense is now down to 3,000. They have now fraudulently increased these earnings by making these little adjustments. And very similar, they also assigned arbitrary salvage values to other assets that previously held no salvage value. They failed to record expenses for decreases in the value of landfills as they were filled with waste. They refused to record expenses necessary to write off the cost of unsuccessful and abandoned landfill development projects. This one is interesting. It's a classic case of hmm. improperly capital capitalizing expenses. See, they would start making a landfill, which is an asset, not an expense, since it'll provide future benefit, but then they'll abandon the project. Since there's no future benefit to anyone anymore, it's no longer an asset and should now be expensed. But of course, expensing it would lower their earnings, so they keep it as an asset and just attach that value to a different landfill. They established what? inflated environmental reserves, liabilities, Why would they and connections do that, with though? acquisitions so that the excess reserves could be used to avoid unrelated operations. Why would they not continue the landfill project i mean were they not picking up enough waste at that time because you're gonna we're gonna always produce garbage you feel me Creating expenses and properly capitalized a variety of expenses in addition to that one i already mentioned or they rent it out sufficient. rent it out to a smaller garbage uh company you know or waste management company 
reserves, liabilities to pay for income taxes and other expenses, however much of that you retained, just realize that this is all illegal and it was done to make their income look higher than it was. Here's a table showing how much they originally stated in earnings compared to the amount that they restated. So basically how much they lied and said they made compared to how much they actually made. In my comparison where that kid changed his grade and lied to his parents, that was basically a victimless crime. I mean, it was hurting himself in the long run, I guess, but this had actual victims. Think of the investors, the people who bought stock in waste management over this time. It's hard to decide which stock to buy, looking at all the information and determining who's doing well and who's gonna grow and where you can make the most money. Well, one of the big tools that people use to make this decision are these numbers. Hmm. There were people in 1996 who did their homework. They saw that waste management made $192 million that year and decided to buy their stock based on that information, when in reality, they lost $39 million. It's not right. And consider that number was That's guaranteed crazy, to be accurate, bro. backed by the company and verified by an independent auditing firm. In this case, it was one of the big five firms, Arthur Anderson, who you may recognize from the much more famous Enron scandal. Here's what happened. I guess Arthur Anderson would come in, perform their audit, verify all the numbers, and tell waste management, hey, we found some irregularities and you need to make these adjustments before we can sign off on this. And then waste management would come back and say, yeah, just sign off on that and we'll deal with all that later. Amazingly, Arthur Anderson agreed to that and gave them an unqualified opinion, which I know doesn't sound good, but it's actually the best opinion you can give. Turns out there were conflicts of interest going on and Arthur Anderson would make more money keeping them as a client. It was all crooked. Of course. The same thing happened year after year. There is plenty of blame to go around here, but the man thought to be the most responsible for all this was the CEO, chairman of the board, and founder that we discussed earlier, Dean Buntrock. As the SEC says, he's the one who set earnings targets, maintained a culture of fraudulent accounting, personally directed certain accounting changes be made to make targeted earnings earnings and was the spokesperson who announced these earnings to the public. Hmm. All of these lies made the company appear much better than it actually was, but they also benefited him personally. The SEC estimates that he's gained more than $17 million through performance-based bonuses, retirement benefits, charitable giving, and selling company stock while the fraud was happening. For what? example, he received a tax benefit by donating inflated company stock to his former college to fund a building in his name. It's, it's just inexcusable. The results? Well, Arthur Anderson paid a $7 million penalty which was the largest ever against an accounting firm. In addition to $220 million that they agreed to pay with Waste Management to settle shareholder lawsuits, Waste Management's management team agreed to pay over $30 million to the SEC, most of which came from Bunt Rock. There were penalties and fees and settlements paid all around, but that's the extent of the consequences. Obviously, today, the company's back on their feet and doing better than ever. Waste Management, that is, not Arthur Anderson. I have a video about Enron if you want to hear more about that. Wow. But first, let me know in the comments, what do you think of this whole thing? As I said, I think it's just inexcusable. I'm curious, have you ever heard of this scandal? Because I feel it gets overshadowed by Enron and some of the others going on at that time, but this was big. That's we have crazy. new laws in place to prevent this, so I like to think that accounting scandals of this magnitude are a thing of the past. But they're important to look back on, and I'm glad I was able to shine some light on the scandal. That shouldn't be forgotten. And of course, let me know any other- Nah, facts, because I never heard about this scandal. Never heard about this scandal at all. Why is my cap on? You heard just like that you could show some support gang. So thanks for uh thanks for checking out today's video and I'ma see y'all in the next one.